Welcome. It's time for Talking in Stations. I am Matter All here with a few friends. We're going to meet some new people today. They're having a great discussion in Talking in Stations. I thought I'd bring them in and we could get their opinions on some things that are going on in EVE Online. First, I want to make a few announcements. Uh, the first one is that uh, Crossing Zebra's editor or former editor, Naiden, is back at EVE Online. We talked to him over the weekend on the Sunday show. He is joining Talking in Stations as an editor, as the editor actually. So we're happy to have him uh, jump aboard and join the team. So we'll be publishing articles on talkingstations.com. If you want to read some longer form stuff, uh, we're going to have an article or two or three a week. And then we'll definitely have our daily uh, news briefs going out all the time, two or three of those a day. That's uh, the cadence that we're going to try to do, uh, give you the full news experience on talkingandstations.com. Uh, and it's really mobile friendly, so you should check that out. Also, if you haven't already, sign up for the Talking In Stations newsletter, TIS News. You can do that by going to your mail client inside the game. At the very bottom left, you'll see a button saying add uh, our new email list and uh, our mailing list. And you would want to put TIS News on there uh, to get that every day during the week. It's like your daily paper inside the game. Okay, let's get some Eve stuff. Uh, first thing is that if you, this is really late because it broke over the weekend. We weren't able to cover it until today. Uh, I think we talked about it yesterday too on the podcast, but um, it's the Black Friday tax haven inside the game. So this is not some sale for items in the game. It is actually inside the game and it's 50% off your sales tax. Uh, let me actually bring that up on screen there. And this ends uh, November 30th at 11. I believe that's downtime today. So you still have some time. This really helps out if you're going to bulk sell some stuff, you'll get uh, instead of a 5% tax, it's like a, or ex actually instead of 2.5% tax, like a 1.13% tax with high skills, I think. Um, but yeah, so anyway, uh, I've been taking advantage of that all day today. I've been selling things and uh, it's, uh, it's a nice little, it's a nice little touch for this time of the year, I suppose. Although I do feel like when real life enters the game in this way, it feels a little bit foreign. All right, well, let's get to know some of the guys here. We'll square up so you can see all of them, even the guys without cameras. First uh, to my left here is uh, DTM. How you doing? Hey, man, how's it going? Good. You're a known person. Uh, I think you do a lot of Alliance tournament stuff or you've done some tournament stuff but also you're a small yep. gang guy what tell us about yourself yeah, streamer i'm a i'm a content creator streamer uh first and foremost and i run tournaments and most of my play styles are like a uh, small micro fleets that kind of stuff just with me and my friends yeah all right cool uh also here we have um I, am i gonna call you snoo or am i gonna call you I, i'm holy monk Unholy Monk, okay, and this is uh, representing Unholy Monk is is Nidhogger, nice looking ship. What's up? Where are you from? Uh, originally, I'm from Washington State. In game? Oh, in game, Goonswarm Federation. <laughs> in this particular conversation, that's where Goonswarm lives in Washington State. Oh, good, you're Holy Pacific. Yeah, so it's not too late yet. Good to meet you. Uh, also, you heard Murray there. How's it going, Murray? No. You're going to have to say more than that. Murray, what do you do in the game? I'm a mid-scale player slash FC, and I do a fair bit of solo stuff as well. All right, cool. And also, it, we have a new friend here. Sounds a lot like Pando. Strata, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, a... I've been flying since uh, 2008, and uh, I've mostly kept myself to small gang stuff. I'm currently with uh, dock workers in Losec. Ah, oh, dock workers, cool. All right, you're represented by uh, Cinnable. That's right. Yeah, small kitey stuff. Nice. Coincidentally, we're also about to have some fun with dock workers ourselves in one of our side corps that we uh, play with, uh, Trent Industries from Heldon. Is that there a, you go. Is that a goons form side? Or is no. It, oh, it's your own thing. Okay. 
All right. Well, let me open up some questions. Doesn't have to be what we were talking about earlier. Um, because you guys, it sounds like the majority of you guys are kind of small gang, right? Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think most people here have pretty decent, like small, mid-sized experience, which is a uh, interesting group to be in TIS for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, we want more of that. Uh, also, I forgot to say, Gregorin, as always, is here. He's our researcher at TIS, one of them. Uh, Gregorin, how you doing? All right. Good. Yeah, even though I do... Even though I've been mostly doing block warfare stuff recently, I also like to think I have a decent small gang background. Hmm. All right. Well, let's test it. You know, this is a great group to ask an ESS question. How are you guys finding that new mechanic? Um, it's pretty good. Um, I just, my main thing is they're going to need to up the reward for ratting, particularly with the drone changes otherwise i don't think i'll be finding a lot of people to actually fight so myself and dtm and a few others were having a uh lovingly called discussion about this earlier we're on uh, opposite ends of the spectrum here i believe it was dtm at least that was arguing that it's too heavily slated for the defense and i think that it's just fine as it was yeah hot hot take coming in i uh for the scales I fly at, I think it is a uh, it's it's too punishing to attackers. I think uh, you can make some slight changes to the way the uh, mechanics work inside the bubbles to make it a little more forgiving. Mm. Even if you like your MWD was like half as effective or something like that, the fact that you're flying mostly MWD ships around Nullsec, you know, once you get into that area and your ship is now not as effective as it was so you know if they jump into something that has you know ab's now you you basically can't move and you can't really go in there and contest you have to do it more as like a intentional thing it can't just be something that you you bump into have you guys found that it's more popular as it goes or is was there a big initial popularity boost for it and it's kind of uh, winding down or settling down very big initially bit, bit of a slowdown but it's still pretty popular i think until we see whatever change they're going to make with the reserve bank idea i i would i would agree uh nominally with dtm on most things about how it's too heavily slated into defense with the main bank idea i don't think the risk is worth the reward but i think once that reserve bank comes into play you'll see a greater maybe depending on what they do a greater upsurge in people trying to steal from them and then I think that that defense is, uh, the upper defense of them is justified completely. Yeah, so for those that don't know, there are two banks. So as you're working the fields, let's call it, drone, going out there and destroying NPCs and getting bounties for that, uh, your money is being collected and a certain portion of it scraped off, like 40%, to these banks. And one of them is a long-term bank. So one's a short-term bank that people can raid every three hours, but the other one collects over a long period of time and the keys aren't really available yet we don't know in what way ccp is going to distribute those keys that will allow you to go and get the long-term bank right like let's call it the vault right you can rob the bank but it's another thing to get into the vault where the uh, the big money is um, what do you guys think is going to happen is ccp going to hand out those keys in some particular way nobody has any idea I think, if anything, it would be something in high sec uh, as far as like a ratting event or something along those lines, maybe even a low sec uh, small gang PvP type of deal. I don't think that they're going to be that widely distributed, though, but I could be completely wrong. And I think that those keys will be quite valuable based off the amounts in most reserve banks is usually in the billions. Uh, I think that those keys are going to be quite expensive, and there is risk in taking those out to Nullsec. Yes, but it's still a wait and see. I don't think anyone has any idea. I guess like my perspective would be that based off of the way that you know the game is like a 24-hour game, so you, you couldn't have something that you could just sneak on somebody's downtime and, and rob the bank. That would be a bit unfortunate so I, I feel like there might be something where there's a timer that gets started and people can see when when the the vault will open so that they can form up properly for it because it's you know there's some of them are, are worth several billion isk and that, that's not a small amount of money for a lot of these blocks that's a good point all right like if uh they give out fraternities uh 
bank keys or vault keys we'll call them um and people raid them when fraternity is asleep is that is that good gameplay or yeah interesting maybe it syncs up with the structures or something who knows i think there could be something along the lines of um somebody puts a key in and it uh they can maybe set a time window for when it unlocks and then then you can know you know when to come back yeah so uh goon bear freehand let's see goon bear freehand says uh, let's see his first comment was null blocks will just get their own reserve bank you think uh, that's viable I mean, there's something to be said for the fact that it, it happens in NullSec with these ESSs, but also there's no potential loss for those ratting in HiSec or otherwise as far as the ESSs go. So I think that, yes, by definition, he's right. It is the reserve bank for people in Null, but I don't think it's going to be used that way, I think, as he's stating. Yeah. Wouldn't it be interesting if like a group says, look, you guys go rat, We'll lower taxes to zero, but we get the reserve bank. <laughs> so that's how they'll collect. Oh, we'll help you secure it, right? Because that, that to me is going to be the thing. It's going to, I guess as a small gang person, I worry that because the values are getting up there in a lot of these spaces, that it's going to be more for the larger blocks, whereas the normal ESS is more designed for the smaller. Oh, that's a gang. good point. Right. To me, it looks like it's being designed for mid-scale fights like the main bank is what you fight over with your small gang and then when you want to go like a reserve bank you're thinking like a 20 to 40 man fleet kind of deal right i think that's what ccp thinks i guess if i betting man i'd bet on them messing it up and a bunch of money being taken at 15 minutes after downtime but that's just because I have very little faith in them to execute this properly. The interesting thing that I that I see is that like moons, they kind of scale differently. So you can see some that are you know seven billion esque, but there are some there that are only you know six hundred million esque. So again, it might be there might be opportunities for smaller gangs to take out these smaller prize pools, which larger gangs won't bother with. And I, and I feel like there has to be some sort of commitment to the field in order to make these things worth the while so they might have to stay on field for like an hour or something in order to to get the reserve out fully or it might tick over time and you may have to sit there yeah well, it certainly feels like there's a lot of opportunity to game the system uh, but i wonder how they must have thought it through how they're going to get bigger groups to fight over bigger amounts like that reserve bank i was thinking when they first did it that it would be like the rating of uh providence when the stations were going to be transferred over to faction fortizars like there was a big gold rush right so i thought that this is the potential to create those gold rushes over and over again because the station transfer was a one-time thing it can never be repeated but they might have liked the results looking at statistics of what happened there and they might have thought how do we recreate that big money uh, appointment raid um, again and again you know how do we do that that's what i think the reserve banks is probably supposed to be something major to fight over to really sink your assets into fighting over it right and i i would venture to say as far as like goomba free like i'll address a couple of questions i guess like as far as yeah. goomba freehand says you're already taxed on your ratting bounty as it is i i don't think in most cases my own personal opinion that no blocks will take the reserve banks from their players it's it's definitely possible i just don't see it really happening because that would alienate well, a lot of people to the idea of it uh, as is. far as nick bikeson's question goes though um if i'm not sure why they would do it that way where they would have two alliances that are in the same coalition steal each other's banks when they could just pay out the banks as necessary I think you're going to see more solo players and small gang things. And like I was telling DTM before, I think you're going to see a lot of T3 uh, cruiser gangs coming in and trying to steal from these, but we'll have to see the mechanics of it. All right, cool. All right. I mean, Go in ahead. larger groups, there's really no way to send the reserve banks to the individuals who actually ratted that money initially because too many people ratted in a specific system, too many people had 
different hands and different pots, so to speak. So you're going to see pretty much all that money go into Alliance coffers. It, it depends if they have the option, right? It might be you can take or you can give back to those who it was removed from. They, they've already laid out what that mechanic is, so mm. to speak. If you look in the ESS window, um, it goes to the players who are in the ESS when it's shared out. Mm. And they get a certain amount every minute over the course of X amount of minutes. So we're going to get smart bombed with ISK. <laughs> So that is uh, Murray talking with uh, Strata there in that last exchange. If it's hard to see who's talking, I'll, I'll try to clarify that a little bit since we have a group of new people coming. Let me, let me uh, change the topic uh, to something else, and that is a little more open for you guys. What are some of the concerns right now, top of the head, for um, small gang PVPers these days? They've been doing, so like, if I'm being 100% honest, I don't know. I, I know I don't speak for all of the small gangers. They've been doing a lot of changes that have had a, I'm going to just say, a very good effect on small gang life. Needle Jack filaments that came out, what was it, around uh, the beginning of this year, mm -hmm. were absolutely huge to our culture and absolutely huge to our people. Um, those, came out in a, easier... those came out in a permanent way, I believe, earlier this yeah. year, but they were audition reindeer before that yeah yeah they were auditioned last christmas uh sorry go ahead just to be clear yeah and so uh, i think what's come out of it is just just like just using that as a as singular change is that um we we've seen our culture kind of be reinvigorated and i think there's more people from places that weren't before doing it um it's really easy to get a fleet together to go do things it's not as much of a uh, a headache um it's it's an easier like more random version of wormholes essentially uh to to that credit though i think in my opinion my biggest concern on or rather like maybe even one of my last concerns with with uh solo content and like small game content comes down to like uh things that have more to do with outside game tools like the kill board actually you mean the api that feeds the kill boards yeah. i think uh i think it's i don't want to necessarily say it's like to the detriment but i'd like to see more i think i'd like to see more impartial information um just just spread more misinformation or, or just spread or, or make that uh, information a little less accessible. Maybe take away some of what I, I, this is personal, what I deem to be some of the stigmatism around loss in the game. Cause uh, I think we've all experienced loss and we don't like it. Um, and I feel like maybe as a, as a player base, we sort of stigmatize it a bit. All right. Uh, you said like three different things there. I wasn't quite following. Do you want more information on the API or do you want more, Obscure. Less information or less, less information less, coming out. Less of information or maybe even misinformation. Misinformation is that's the first time I've heard that. All right, I have a question yes. here from uh Uncle Thelzer. He says, question for a small group. Uh why do you why do so few small gangs use E War? Uh, not just ECM, but painters, damps, etc. The few I see I, do use it tend to be so tend to be so much more effective. So why the question is, why don't you guys use more E-War? I, I mean, most small gangs do use it pretty extensively. Um, if you ask anybody in kind of the small gang community, some of the scariest and most impactful ships you can fly as an individual pilot are things like a Carries or a Hyena. Because a good, a good Hyena or a good Carries pilot can pretty much entirely negate a lot of enemy ships and enemy threats. Those are Ewar e e frigates, am I right? I would agree. Yes, those are the T2 Ewar frigates. Okay. There's... I would agree with that. And also, uh, me and DTM were talking about this earlier. Uh, personally, I find actually something like Dotland to give a lot more information for when I'm doing filament roams than anything else. I don't really hunt Z kill for where things are dying. I more hunt Dotland and for ratting and stuff like that. Oh. But as, as far as addressing the E-War question, yeah, okay. I think that a lot of that comes down to also knowing what you're fighting, right? If I know that I am in a small gang of people and I'm going to go to where I have war targets or the small gang focus area, and I know they like to use Triglavian uh, ships a lot, 
I might bring uh, optimal range disruption scripts and some Evor rather than something else because I know that I have pretty much completely nerfed their tactical advantage and their damage by making it so they can't even shoot me. Yeah, and, and there's, there, there tends to be a big difference between small gang and like more. I would say small gang tends to be less organized from the standpoint of what you're bringing in terms of ships, whereas it tends to be more, you know, on the field. Uh, decisions that are being made by individual individual pilots so you know you're not you're not looking for the most optimal setup and and t- to some extent that comes down to like engageability like if you bring like like something that just destroys everybody and they never get to fight back or they don't even perceive the ability to fight back then they're probably not going to fight you so so there, there's there's multiple things that go into it and the other thing is you know the best way to get rid of something and the most you know consistent way is just to blow it up so just damage a lot of the time is pretty good e-war yeah your your slot so like your your value on which you're putting a ship changes a lot when you're bringing a limited number so like to me as soon as i get more than 15 guys i'm no longer in a small gang but a lot of people might argue it's all the way up to to 20 guys um i would say that's like a mid-sized gang so um, I, I think you, people might even make arguments that more than 10 um, is, is no longer a small gang. Um, so that, that's a question that's kind of hard to answer. But like more importantly, when you look at bringing a ship, bringing the value, like do I need the DPS? Is, some, is this maybe filled by two other roles in particular? So things like target painters and damps can kind of go by the wayside because what's a lot more important, generally speaking, is going to be things like webs and uh like long scrams and and maybe jams in some regard um i do see those every now and again mm-hmm. but those generally take priority well because oh. to, to some extent you're you're trying to prevent you know, like in a small gang you're wanting to go and get a fight and if you if you come up against a bigger gang actually your biggest problem is the smaller ships so a lot of the time you're trying to kill those quickly so that you can now increase your engagement window if you don't deal with them quickly then you're you're just going to get overwhelmed very quickly thanks strata that's that's what i was going to do is have you open up that topic why were why are the webs usually more important than the other e-war and so you just gave one scenario where that's true uh go ahead murray one of the other things and why you'll end up seeing more of like the carries or the um, hyena, as opposed to say like a kitsune, which is one of the big jamming ships, is they can use their ewar to protect themselves. Because in a small gang, everybody's moving around, and the ability to screen enemy tackle and enemy ships off of yourself, either by damping out their damage or webbing the tackle away from you, is very valuable. Whereas with the kitsune, you're forced to rely on other people screening the enemy for you. So webs and damps tend to have that advantage as well. Yeah, and I would absolutely agree with that. The other interesting thing that you'll see in small gang is actually people running alts. And what happens a lot in those situations is they'll have their main ship, which would be probably their DPS ship, um, and then a secondary ship that's probably a fast tackle ship. Um, and and But generally, like, you know, you're, you're piloting that, that tackle ship um, at the beginning of the fight to grab the guy and then you're setting an orbit and then hoping it doesn't die and then you know piloting your main ship to apply damage. Yeah, and I, w- I would still also argue too, it also comes down to knowing what you're fighting. If I, if I go with DTM on a filament roam and we're hunting ratting myrmidons or battleships, like a target painter, not really going to help us at all in that situation. Unless we're in stealth bombers. And with the filament, yeah. you don't get to choose, right? You you basically hit your filament, and you're transported somewhere into the well, uh, the, the universe. Well, so there, it, it it's not somewhere, right? If you use a signal filament, you're guaranteed to be around a high ADM location. I think is what they base. I'm not actually entirely sure what they base it on, uh, mm-hmm. but the chances are you're going to be near a high activity area, and you're probably going to be relatively near a ratting system if that's what you're hunting, or some type of site runners or some it, it, like. It, it's the whole the signal versus the noise. It's not as ambiguous as just anywhere in Nullsec. 
Well, I get what you're saying, though. If you're using a filament, you don't know what to prepare for. And uh, what you're saying, Snoo, is that you kind of know what to prepare for because in these systems that you're normally going to go to, there's going to be routers. And that takes me to the next uh, big thing that's hit EVE Online, and that is a change to drones for people who are using them for NPCs. There's no auto-aggression anymore, so you have to direct your drones to attack targets that you pick. And that it doesn't apply to mining and it doesn't apply to PVP, but it does apply to NPCs. And that is a big, big deal because people like to uh, turn on an account, AFK, let the drones do the work while they do something else. And they kind of monitor a couple of AFK clients while they're actually PVPing, for instance, or they're watching Netflix. That's the stigma or whatever. What do you guys think of this change to drones that's coming through? So I've said this like uh, a bajillion times tonight, but you haven't been around to hear it. And I'll say it again for the people in chat. For the people. Um, the the really interesting thing when you look at things like this is this is probably the way it should have been from the beginning. We as players of video games have a strange relationship with the way things are phrased and how punishment versus rewards work. And I'll bring up, uh, as an example, World of Warcraft's rest bar. If you're unfamiliar with World of Warcraft's uh, rest bar and how it came about, when they were playtesting the original World of Warcraft, um, one thing they found is that players were actually playing the game for too long, and they wanted to limit that. So the first way they did it, the first iteration was, after four hours, you got half XP, right? Players hated this. The way that they did it the second time is they did the rest bar. And the rest bar is when you're not playing the game, it builds up a bar of experience, a level worth of, of experience that is doubled in speed, right? So it is a reward instead of a punishment. It's essentially the same mechanical effect, but one is a reward and one is phrased as a punishment. And uh, that actually tested very well. Um, and so, so by the way, maybe, uh, I should yeah. say that the public kind of, the public kind of demanded that because kids were playing the game too long, too many hours, too long sessions, all the time. And so under pressure and scrutiny from the public, WoW decided they would create rewards for taking breaks. And that's what you were talking about there with the, what was it? The mm -hmm. rest bar. The the rest bar is sort of kind yeah. of what, what it has going on there. So so there is a there is a, we have a strange relationship with how we feel about rewards versus these things. And this is probably something that should have been in the game from the very beginning. We want people to play the game um, and actually be active. And it's it's a shame that this got implemented very, very late in it. But uh, hopefully it ends up being something that's that's not too bad. I think my, my potential issue with CCP in this change is not to say that I disagree with the change, but that it comes very quickly after what many would perceive as nerfs to their play style in terms of ratting. So like mm -hmm. this would this would maybe feel like a, a gut punch after being punched in the nose uh, by CCP for many. Yeah, definitely. I think I've heard that criticism quite a bit. So me personally, I've been quite conflicted on how I feel about it. Uh, as Asher Rothy pointed out, like this doesn't, this isn't going to stop the botters, which I don't know if that's their main goal, but it's not going to stop people botting. It's no, but you know what it will do. There. I want to bring, I want to push back on this point because uh, somebody brought it up and I thought it was really good. I wish I remember who it was. Um, but it, it, it makes it so the botters can't hide among the AFKers, right? Like True. maybe this is a way of discovering uh, botters more easily because you're giving them less places to hide now their behavior is more obvious go ahead right but and then the second part being is is like we had the whole outcry when carriers lost their drones and we had to manually target our fires but we got over it and we learned to adapt uh, i've heard people talking about the efficacy of going back to auto targeting missiles which i haven't even heard talked about for any reason in a long time <laughs> as a way of ratting. So I, I yeah. think the player base will be do just fine adapting to the new way, but I don't think it will help combat botting. Uh, yeah. It might help them not hide and it might be able to make them easier to identify, but time will tell. Yeah. I've heard uh, friend or foe missiles. Are they still called that or did they change the name? They're just auto targeting missiles now. Okay. Uh, by the way, those, if you haven't used them and they are kind of rare, at least they were a long time ago, is uh, you launch the missile and it hits whatever's near you. So it's friend or foe. That's why they used to call them that. F-O-F. -F. They hit the, they 
shoot at the last thing to aggress against you, I believe. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, you go ahead. They will, but my understanding is you can use the auto-targeting system in conjunction with those to still engage other things that didn't necessarily aggress you. I don't know how true that is. You know, there was, you mentioned something, I'll back you up just a little bit. It was uh, a time when people would get really upset about things. And I can think back in my time in EVE Online, uh, skill injectors, huge problem when they first came out. And then everybody kind of settled down, actually started liking them. But then they emerged again as a problem later as, they, as the distortions of people getting into uh, big ships became all too easy. But another place where people got really upset was, uh, I don't know if you guys remember CCP Quant, who used to be, uh, I think he was the, the data visualizer for EVE uh, on a business level, but he also did some stuff in the game and he kind of ran the economy, or at least uh, the information from the economy. And he came out and said, uh, defending another CCP, or I think it was Fozzie, who's, who was talking about this change where they were going to nerf fighters for supercarriers. Uh, so Quantum came out in defense of Fozzie and that announcement that was made and said, hey, you guys are making too much money. You got, look how much money you guys make. And he got blasted by the community. And I think he ended up being right. I would argue he was right, but I would still also say that even with the changes to fighters, uh, people have learned to o adapt to each new situation, whether... And then we saw boson ratting becoming a thing. And then we saw the, the uh, disappearance of boson ratting. Uh, as far as the new stuff, though, the one I find the biggest personal hit to myself and I know a lot of other no blockers was the uh, mineral redistribution. That one hurt, huh? Yeah, that hurt my Rorkels a little bit. A little bit. Uh, look, you know, cheer up. There is... Um talk that the Rourke will, will get uh, some new powers or some, it'll get altered in a way that might be pleasing later. They, they want the Oracle, the uh, Rourke to be viable again. Combat, right? Uh, Combat. Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> Combat Rourke, Rourke are, can we talk? Man, I don't know if everybody else feels in this room, but the, the Rourke is absolutely ludicrous, ludicrously strong. It can do like everything. Rourke Rorkwalls will be an essential combat ship until you can put a jump drive on a heavy interdiction cruiser. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I still like uh, the idea of uh, uh, supers someone brought up in another Discord where instead of the super change they, they are doing or did, instead it would be really cool is if like if you were in a stealth bomber or like maybe a new fancy he like cruiser size bomber if you could dock in the super and then they could jump and unleash like a swarm of bombers that'd be pretty cool yeah all right a question here or a comment from mike z He's saying uh, is having to adapt to these changes cons constantly count as content what do you guys think yes um, depends so on the type of change uh, a know lot it feels, of, right? This goes back to like a more fundamental question about game development. And depending on the kind of game, you either have a lot of releases very short together, doing a lot of micro fixes, or you have what uh, what we had for a long time, which was, you know, you might not see a major patch for three months or something like that. Um, but the, the adaptation and the keeping up with the patches is always going to be part of content in almost any game. I could be wrong about that if anybody has a, a differing opinion. The, the problem with EVE is that in, in other of these games, if we're talking like League of Legends, Dota, StarCraft, is that there's no inherent, apart from the practice that you may have with like a certain character or a certain play style, you know, in EVE, there is a, there's a certain amount of built up investment that you have to do in, in some of these play styles. So, you know, if, if they change something, it could make something that you've, that you've been working towards or and not even achieved yet now no longer viable so it, they have to i think be a little bit more careful sometimes in eve i i i have i do agree in some regards because there's uh there's more of an economic factor there as far as like eve economics uh but you think about a lot of other games like people who got really really good with the r8 revolver and counter-strike when it first came out once they nerfed it pretty much into the ground to make it more more you know in line with everything else uh you know those guys lost out on a lot of time that they took mastering that weapon um yeah 
I like this point by Alex Z, uh, who says, at this point, why not allow Capitals in high sec? Uh, I don't know about Capitals, but it would be interesting to see a Rorkel in high sec. It makes sense to me that the Rorkel shouldn't be banned from uh, high sec, unless it's, there's a lore reason, which is the empires don't want the Rorkel competing with their own mining, but you never well, see their mining, so... I would argue that that's the Orca would be the highest tech Oracle. Now giving the ability to compress ore to an Orca would be interesting. Right. But why, what, I guess there's no reason that uh, an industrial ship couldn't be living in high sec. Like it, it seems there's, there would be no reason for that. I mean, if they can take like, gates, you know, I like the idea of, of having you know, carriers and, and dreads moving through high sec because I mean, I, I'm in small, small gang stuff. And for me to move a carrier around is now super difficult because of the fact that they made the changes to, you know, requiring me to, uh, you know, use a, uh, a larger ship, a more expensive ship to Sino. And if I want to move that, join a new corporation or something like that, now it's very difficult. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Nick Bison, his friend of the show there says, I personally love all these small patches changes coming more quickly it is, has drastically forced me to change my play style, and it, sometimes it hurts, but hey, there it is. One thing that with the mining changes, that there was a, forum, a post on the forums today about someone had noticed that scanning uh, moons on the Singularity server uh, looks yeah, like look uh, anomal that. anomaly ore might be coming back to moons. Yeah, this was posted earlier today, uh, Gregorian picked it up let's actually talk about this because i think it would have major connotations if it's real some people say it's a bug some people think it might be real and uh describe it once again gregorian just emphasize the point of what this is well uh, back i believe in april uh they took regular ore out of moon ore yields moon mining yields it used to be that every moon, a certain percentage of what you got was regular ore in addition to the moon goo. Yeah. Uh, no, they have, they have said, okay, so what that means is you, got, you, you might see a little bit of regular ore coming back into moon mining, which it was there before in a bigger way, but it might be a little bit um, kind of moving in that direction again because they might have overcorrected, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, and I, I guess... I mean, it, the question is like, what volumes, how does that compare against yeah. the volumes that you got out of anomalies before? Uh, volumes is always the question, but it's also the, uh, the access points. Um, for instance, uh, not having low end ores in null sec is, is a huge problem for sure, because it doesn't even exist in that area. Um, but then all these other things where you have some dynamicism, like a little bit of, or inside of uh, your moon goo, basically, uh, then that's when they have a little switch on uh, or a little dial that they can turn up or bring down or turn up or bring down depending on the situation. So I think we're seeing a lot of those kinds of systems entering EVE Online. For instance, the ESS dynamic with uh, the bounty system dynamic, those two things have percentages, right? Uh, variables that they can adjust so if it's not if it's too lopsided, they don't have to change the whole mechanic. They just change the variables. If it's forty percent that the bank is taking from you, let's dial that back to thirty five percent and look at it again in a month. Uh, and I think this this or thing is, uh, I imagine this is what we're going to see with minerals in this game. So you're going to see some adjustment to some variables, uh, and this is one of the places where you see minerals. Uh, can be messed with. You can bring minerals in, in a large degree or in a small degree. I hadn't really thought about this until now, but the issue is really that, you know, the minerals that you get in NullSec are the ones that you need very little of. And so therefore the ones that you need in, you get from HiSec now only are the ones that you, that you need a lot of. So transporting those to NullSec to make stuff has got to be so laborious. <laughs> so uh, go ahead. Addressing uh, Nick Bison, I, I agree with him uh, where orcas, I think, are perfectly sufficient for mining in high sec as far as fulfilling the, the, the Rourke aspect. 
if you gave him compression ability, I think it would see them used a lot more. Um, and I think you would see them used a lot more in Nullsec actually as well. Cause if you're not forced into that I core, it's a lot less risk. Uh, yeah, you can't I core for all the extra mining, but you do have the ability to compress stuff and your ore hold would be nice. And, uh, addressing LX's thing, as far as limiting people, like, where do you stop? Are we going to see, cause you can't bubble. So, but if you could have caps, but can't bubble. Do you have all of a sudden capitals in these little war decks and fighting these people with little Asbels and structures, whether it's carriers, super carriers, titans, whatever? And then if you can bubble, do we have to deal with all the people that might troll and lead a line of bubbles from G to four four all the way to the gate? Like, I think I you think have to limit a, people. I think there's even just a from just from a very um, personal thing. It would just be nice to move capitals. I don't want to be able to fire the guns so much as just be able to move them through high sec. Well, and that brings into question though. So if you're moving from high sec, can you store ships in your ship maintenance bay? Then if you can do that, well, I I'm in a war with DTM and I'm at his citadel and my home is in Amar and he's up by uh, heck. And all of a sudden, well, I have my Titan with my ship maintenance bay. If I die, I just go back and pick up another one from the Titan. It can hold a lot. It's great. At, at what point do you... I, I don't think that capital should be in high sec. I understand it's hard to move them if you, if you don't have them through there, but I don't think they should be. All right. Um, one last thing, some clarification from you guys. What do you guys think as far as people who may go and hunt, um, people who are AFK, uh, what do you think of that change? Is that going to actually affect you guys or not? The, I'm talking about the drone changes and how you can't. Catching a Ishtar is, is, it's okay. It's not the sort of fights you're normally looking for, really. You might, you might try to hold it and get a, a fleet going. I mean, again, the, the big concern, I guess, would be that with any of these changes that they're making to ratting would be that people no longer want to use NullSec for the generation of money. Yeah, that is definitely the major concern. Like, it's not that people only ratted in AFK drone ships because that was the optimal way, although it was. They ratted in AFK drone ships because Ratting in an active subcap isn't worth your time. Yeah. And if you're kind of sitting there doing the rational logic of, well, I could be running abyssals, or I could be doing an incursion, or I could be doing exploration, or I could be ratting. The only reason ratting ever went out was because it was scalable mm -hmm. and because it was extremely low effort. Yes, right. Removing yeah. the AFK drones takes away both of those components. So you're left with an activity that makes, you know, 60 to 100 mil an hour doing it with one character. And that's not good. I would, I mean, I would, my argument to that would be is, uh, A, would it be, I, I guess in the, the next topic of conversation, it would be worth it if they could increase bounties. But as far as right now, even with the drone things, I still say there's another options to rat. You can uh, smart bomb battleship rat. Uh, for the big null blocks, you can super or carrier rat if able. I still think that there's plenty of options for ratting. I do see people running abyssals even in places they shouldn't, like 1DQ. Um, I, I think all that content still there. And personally, the only new content I extremely dislike and I stepped one foot in and immediately pulled it back out was Poshvin. I, I don't like the idea <laughs> of Poshvin. You're like, not for me. Well, it wasn't so, so much that I don't like the idea of it. I like that you can go in there and mine. You can make more money, whatever. You can go in there and you can PvP. And it's got a lot of content. The problem is, is I feel it's almost like a content lock. Because I took a, we took a small group of people that had never been in there before. And the first thing we did, we filamented in. And we're like, okay, we can't go to a gate. We understood that part. But what we didn't know is you couldn't use a filament to go from Poshman to Poshman. So we're like, wait, so we have to go back out to then come back in and none of us had extraction filaments on us so we had to go find a station that sold them way overpriced because <laughs> we didn't know that you also needed the extraction filament to go out and then you could go back in so i was like okay this is not even worth it we're done with it let's go home yeah i mean going back to the sub cap ratting thing mm -hmm. um it's particularly because you listed smart bomb ratting the issue is with the dynamic bounty system 
in one of the few systems where you can actually smart bomb rat because it does require a very high number of havens, which requires a very specific type of system. Um, a, that's not an activity that any sort of casual player can get into because it requires four plus accounts and one and a half billion esque ships. And B, you can only do it for like an hour or two in a system before that the dynamic bounty ticker, or but before you've ratted enough that the DBS is going to go down. Dynamic bounty system. And getting the DBS percentage back up without killing people or feeding your own ships is not very viable right now. Right, and I say that those as more experienced alternatives. I think for the newer players going out in that Myrmidon or that Vexer or like the super basic ratting ship, uh, most of those aren't the most, from what I've seen at least, most of those aren't the most comfortable going AFK anyways. Most of them are paying more attention than the average player. So I think for them, the step to active ratting is not that big of a deal uh, in most cases because they're already mostly active anyways. And it, it, it might even help them learning to lock things faster and how to group and target things. Uh, and then as far as hunting them, I think it's going to be about even out because, yes, you with more people being active, you're going to have more people paying attention to D-Scan. But then you'll also have those people that are too busy to look at their D-Scan because they're having to activate all their modules. So I think that'll about even out. The problem is there's so many things you can do that make more money or, and are safer than ratting actively in a subcap. I mean, th that's true even of ratting in a super. I I've heard of people making more money in these triglavian sites in high sec with a Sleptner than I can make ratting with my super in, a ha in rock havens. I, I think an interesting analog would be around in, in wormhole space. You have a, you know, if you're living in wormhole space, as I did for a bit, um, you have a certain amount of anomalies in your, in your space and you can exhaust those every day. And and maybe, but maybe maybe we could see you know the fact that these are now kind of exhaustible supplies of rats because the bounties go down. But maybe we should see an increase in the bounty payout, and therefore you can rat for less time. And therefore, it's a we don't have to have all these people just sat in I don't know semi AFK. They can rat for an hour and get their their money out of the system and then go do something else. Yeah, exactly. And that's the kind of thing I've been arguing for for a while. Is like even if it was something as basic at the time rate as just doubling the payout per um, anomaly, but like quintupling the time it took the anomaly to respawn. So that brings me to a curious point I've been wondering. Do you guys think that the, like it used to be in EVE, you had these stats, right? Most people, not not everybody, I'm not I'm not saying everybody did this, but most people usually step from high sec to low sec to null sec or mining to PVP do you think that shifted where more people are like remaining in high sec because they don't want to go do this stuff or they think it's more profitable in high sec that you can transition from high sec to high sec from low low uh, risk, low reward to medium risk, very high reward even? I think the, the career path is high sec to low sec to null sec back to high sec these days. <laughs> In fact, I, I just, what's, one of the funny things about this is you haven't seen a lot of ganking on mining because there are so many nullsec miners out there that you don't know if that's your friendly alt. Uh, so they basically said, stop killing people in high sec while they're mining because it could be us. That's how many people are out there. Mm. Are you are you sure about that? Yeah, yeah. I heard it from somebody. That I, I mean, say. so yet again, I think that comes down to the individual because even yesterday uh, we we have we, we have a naughty people corp and I, I had an orca out. Uh, there was this dude suspect baiting in his uh, tempest Sus. and killing MTUs and I went out and engaged him with my battle orca and we ended up killing him in his tempest and he uh, rage logged. So I think there are still people out there doing the suspect games and uh, ganking miners and stuff. Uh, I have a, okay. I have another buddy who ganked a skiff yesterday in high sec. I think I think an interesting trend I've seen is is actually more people who are considered like elite PvPers or people who PvP primarily who actually have mining alts. Like that's something that I wouldn't have seen five years yeah. ago. We left we left the mining to to the miners and they did their thing. But it seems to be reasonably lucrative now. I actually did extract all my mining skills on all my characters because I thought that's one thing I'll never do again. 
And was I wrong? I think you're going, were you going to say something? Did I cut you off? Yeah, I think uh, with the suicide ganking, they've gotten more specialized. Like some people go, only do freighters, for example. And just ganking an inexpensive mining ship is something that doesn't really happen as much in unless people just can't find targets. Well... So, like like everyone that plays Eve, uh, the gankers, uh, Kujan, McLovin, all these guys, if, if you don't think they're spending an enormous amount of time doing, like, internet spaceship math to figure out exactly what they need to kill, whatever it is they're trying to kill, they, they spend a lot of time uh, scouting, doing intel, making spreadsheets of their own just to gank that one freighter so they know, okay, no matter what kind of freighter you brought in here, you have now lost that freighter. Uh or and it just happens that freighters are usually the best reward because you're you're only making money off what drops. I mean, those guys for the most part aren't doing it to pat their killboards. Their killboards look good enough as it is. They're doing it for I have to make enough money off what drops. Now, okay, maybe a, a fancy battleship such as a Kronos or something like that comes through. That might be worth ganking because he might have fancy modules on there. But in most cases, that dude running his rupture through is not going to have faction, dead space, uh, fancy abyssals or officer mods on them. It's going to be maybe tech two fit. Yeah, mining ships in particular are unlikely to be fit expensively enough to be worth the cost of ganking. Especially well, that's where they can be because those catalysts can be so cheap that literally, like, if they drop like one or two, like one maybe two strip miners and some of that ore, you can make your money back. If they happen to have ore strip miners, you made way more than your money back. And a lot of people in high sec versus anywhere else like to use like ore strip miners or augmented drones that might drop because they like to pull in their drones and put out combat drones. So now their mining drones have a chance to drop. Or if they've left them out, you can now scoop them. So that's where you can make back your money, even ganking those mining barges and those exhumers. Even or if you're not trying to pat your kill board. Or strip miners are the faction variant of the strip miner. Strip miner one, strip miner two, and then they have the or O R E uh, for outer ring excavations. That's uh, the faction. One last question, guys, before we go. Um, when you're out there looking for someone to kill, what kind of reconnaissance do you do as far as the character's concerned? Do you look at their kill boards real quick? Do you look at their character do you look at what corporation history they have anything like that yes to all of the above <laughs> it's super dependent on what i'm doing if i'm stalking you because someone's paid me to kill you or i have a vendetta against you or something like that it's it's going to be super methodical if i'm just out roaming and i know you're hunting me and you're in a loki i might just do a quick killboard search um, sometimes I don't even look at stuff and I just YOLO it and go for it. Weird stuff comes out of it. Right. Yeah, and then there's also dot land. And then, you know, you might use locator agents on them. If you're hunting someone to find out where they are, there's all kinds of methods you can use. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but generally like who they're associated with will give you a reasonable understanding of like what they're, what they're going to be doing. Yeah. I'll always click on them to see what court alliance they're in. Yeah, does, it, does anything intimidate um, you when you see that? gives me an idea. Um, what I mean, groups, what groups it might, intimidate it you might change my reaction. Tuskers. Right? Like, uh, if, it's an, from code. Oh. if it's an an a Nereus and like an NPC corp, then I might just go blow it up. But if it's a Nereus and Slice and it's sitting out in tribute, I know that that thing has 30 bombers and a Hugan behind it. Yeah, the, the location matters significantly as well. Yeah, if you find and a solo it's... procure in an anomaly in a wormhole, mine him by himself with what looks like no one around, that's suspicious. That's, that's <laughs> bait. <laughs> but uh, but you were asking about groups. There's, there's definitely some, uh, let's say, Goring Clade, that's another one. Dock workers I'd be pretty scared of. Some snuff guys are really good. There's a, there's a lot of really good pilots out there. Yeah. Have you ever keeping up with what keeping up with what corporation Gorn Quaid is currently in is always a good idea unless you want to accidentally feed. <laughs> That's very true. Do you um, do you ever see somebody saying like, "Oh, there's an opportunity," and then you research who it is, uh, and you're like, "Nope, not going to attack them." 
Yes. I have done that before. So that, that happens. Yeah. And just have, like you've seen them do things previously or you check their kill board, you're like, okay, yeah. This I've guy, dodged this guy a couple of people I was hunting. I've dodged a couple of people I was hunting in DD sites because I looked up their kill board. Sometimes you'll be like, uh, figured out what they were up to. Let's get a little, let's get close. Let's let's point them, but nobody get into scram range of them. You know, let's be able to bail if if something else comes in. Yeah. Oh, interesting. It's also that's, it's that's also awful. a problem I run into when I'm hunting other people because if I'm looking for a target and I find somebody and they look me up when I get into local. And they see that uh, right on the top thing on my like top five kills are three Tengus and a Loki, and they're sitting in their DD running Tengu. A couple of brain cells start to activate, and they say, "Wait a minute, he might be here for me." And then they run away. So they're all right. cowards. I'd say it's also a case by case basis. Like, but before the Sino changes, um, I was warping around in uh, an interceptor. And there was, and we had a lot of wars going on at the time. And I had like uh, 50 war targets in system. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get out of here quick. And as I'm about to warp away, a suspect providence from their, uh, an alt of their corp landed on the gate. And I was like, super bait? I don't know. <laughs> and then turns out we killed them with a little bit of help. But pirate showed up because they're also at war with them. And like, no, this guy just died. No one showed up to help him. And he had two structures in his cargo hold. Not sure why. All right. <coughs> Sorry about that. Oh, I think I forgot. Good? I forgot the mute. We never did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we never did what we came for, right? Yeah, right. We never talked about the state of capitals and evacing and all that. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> never talked it? about the war. Ten more minutes. Then. The let's, the war. Let's, let's set this up. Right. Let's set this up properly. Go ahead, DTM, if you want to. So, so I guess I'll just start with, uh, I will give the perspective of somebody who, who is pretty detached from the war. Um, but I kind of keep up with the, 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 I would say the general, the overarching goings ons. And we were speaking earlier about a really interesting situation because to, I will say the majority of us, and this is an opinion, not a fact, but for, for the majority of the people in this chat, the, the writing's sort of on the wall for the way that things are going to go in Delve. We don't know necessarily how far things are going to go, but we were discussing what it might be like if you were a goon pilot and now you're looking at in potentially the next year having a length of uh, an undetermined length amount of time when you might end up in a situation where you have to evac and how that might be done. And more importantly, if you do have to evac and there's no keep stars around, um, you know, p pilots are pr not used to space coffins anymore and sort of going back to that and how that might affect like morale and affect pilots. By space coffins, you mean living in space outside of a station? Yeah. yeah so, so to add some detail to that, um, the previous time the goons had evac'd, in a similar fashion where they evac'd from the First World War B to Saarinen and Losek. Most, this was before the time of Keepstars for the most part. Citadels were coming in, but it wasn't a big thing yet. And so all of their supercarrier and Titan pilots were dedicated characters. Or if they weren't, those pilots had sitter characters that they would leave in those ships while they did other things. In the four or five years it's been since then, a lot of people have gotten super caps or they've gotten like multiple super caps for individual characters. And so they have a lot of super capital ships, but not dedicated pilots. And when you don't have a keep star to put those in, you're forced to either stick them in asset safety, sell them off, or go and join a group that does have keep stars that you can put those super capitals in. And the question of how many people in goons are willing to asset safety supers for an undetermined amount of time, or sell them off at what would probably be very low prices, or might simply say, you know what, I'm gonna go somewhere I can play with my supers and do what I wanna do with my supers. Right. And go for that direction. And that opportunity is right there in front of them, right? They can just say, like, I'm going to cross the bridge over to that keep star in uh, TZ or T5Z, or I'm going to jump over to uh, YTAC 
was it uh, YZ9? Like they have options if they want to just like switch sides for safety. And that's got to be really tempting. So it's a real testament to Imperium that that hasn't happened like in in a big, big way. It's happening, but it's little trickles. It's not a huge, huge thing. Yeah, I, I think we'd, we'd see a lot faster of a collapse amongst a less cohesive group. One that had maybe less spin. I don't know. Yeah. Well, wholesale corporations I mean, and alliances moving over. Taking the whole spin games out of the situation, because no matter what no block you are, let, let, let's be honest here, there's, there's always spin games being played. Oh That's part God. of the game. Let, we'll uh, talk about spin after this, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, but as far as like evacing, right? Even if uh, all all of Goon's Titans got asset safety or whatever, they they would eventually all be back out, and that's what my argument was: is what whether it it's going to happen in you know anytime soon? It is possible that Goons may lose every single keep side of their own, but I don't think that will push Goons out of the game. They are still going to be a functioning alliance, uh. And I think that when the war eventually does end, because the, as, eventually the other side's going to just give up or get tired of assaulting, whether it's still in goons is still in Nullsec or whether they made their way to Losec, they're just going to give up and get tired. And then, you know, goons can just wait till the inevitable falling outs and infighting occurs because to pretend like all these groups that are fighting goons love each other, I don't think anyone truly thinks that, that they all love each other. When people understand that there's plenty of groups that don't like each other. And so when the goons thing goes away, they're going to left to fight each other. And that's why I think that the argument that no matter who wins or loses in this pandemic court wins is relatively true. Um, I think goons will come back in whatever space they come back in. That will be the new home. I think we'll have an I probably think we'll have a new Saranen and then we'll have a new home, whether it's whatever region it ends up being. I don't think goons will be removed from the game, no matter what some people may believe. You're in Imperium, you're in Imperium, right? Correct. Okay. I think the big question that kind of, and the one that I'm sure Billy would like an answer to, but probably doesn't have on hand is how many pilots are willing to kind of do the goon hardcore regroup go somewhere new because the imperium writ large did lose a lot of people after world war b when they went to saranen and they started out in delve much smaller than they've been before mm. and so i would imagine that one of the end goals for the pappy guys isn't necessarily to kill goons they can say it is but i think they know deep down that you're not just going to, you know, cause goons to fail Cascade. Right. But the question and is, can they reduce the goon super cap capital numbers down to a point where goons aren't this kind of big overlooming threat that prevents them from doing other things? Yes. Right. Like so, fighting each other. So if goons has got that hypothetical, whether it's a year from now, five years from now, whatever, Goons is gone. Goons is completely out of the game. Goons don't exist anymore. Who's the new big bad? What? Everybody I mean, says, everybody says eternity, but... There, there's, a, there's, a real, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a real possibility of a couple groups becoming the new big bad. I think what's kind of important to take away from that, though, is the, 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 the reason... So we've had like a three kings situation. I don't know if you guys understand quite what I mean when I said... Three kings, yeah. three kings, yeah. Um, where you know nobody can make really a move on the on each other, and what was decided is because goons were the big bad guy. They were also so strong that if the other two people fought each other, goons would just come in and pretty much lay the smack down on the on the the weakened other group. That uh, you know maybe moving goons to a less favorable position to where the rest of the group could the rest of the organizations can fight amongst themselves and really go at it uh is kind of the decision that was that that has been and uh we're currently been made and we're kind of kind of kind of see that coming out of it i don't i don't know if there's really much i don't know if there's really another way to interpret it i don't think i don't think there's necessarily going to be a next big bad group if if what i'm hearing is true and people do kind of want to break up the super blocks after this is all done and they want to go to you know 
just more fighting and more content and looking at significantly less blues, I think that's a good thing for the entire game. Yeah, as a, as a small uh, small gang person, you know, having everybody in these large fleets um, all grouped up is a pain in the ass because there's no way in how you can engage any of it. You know, they're all immune and they'll just blap you. So, so it's better for everybody. I think that while I hate to say this, uh, DTM, I think what you're saying though is is kind of a pipe dream because you're asking. Uh, all these people uh, that are heads of these alliances to just give up that power. I don't think that's ever going to happen. No, I'm they're They're not giving up their power. They're giving up their relationships. I, I don't think that they're going to do, because you you're also, not going to be like, Oh, you no, have to no. keep in mind, right? It's not just the one Alliance leader who makes all the decisions in terms of larger groups breaking apart. It's generally the corporation leaderships that make those choices. Right. So if you're There's uh, a lot of corporations that choose to leave the larger groups because they see better content and better opportunities elsewhere. And the more kind of blued up and stagnant Nullsec is, the more corporations you see make that decision. There's so, be I mean, like, do you. There's going to be a certain amount of fatigue around these large fights that we've been having that people want to go to something a little more simple, a little bit more. <laughs> time sense it like time conscious you know I, I think you know that might that might be a, a driving force there too i mean what would be the level of fatigue because if you think about it like the null blocks of eve we we call you know the, the there's a whole blue donut idea but if you think about it ever since pretty much this game was created you've had these null blocks yeah there, there's lulls in the fighting but they always go back to another war whatever they want to call it so at what point is that fatigue setting into where I don't want to go to another alliance war again. I just want to go rat or I just want to go mine. Leave me alone. I want to go do my own thing. And then the director's going, you know what? That's a great idea. I'm going to give up all this power and all this influence I will and all these fleets I can command. And I'm just going to go mine in the corner too. I mean, because it's what, not about wanting you're to go mine in the corner. It's about wanting to go and find better content. Like right. prior yeah, like, to this current war, brand new bros, um, not boss, the name of the actual corporation that started it, but Brotherhood of Spacers. Star Frontiers? Yeah, Star Frontiers, Suicide Kings. There were a number of corporations that left Test because they were bored, essentially. And they and realized Dread that... Bomb started out of other ex-Test people. Right. And, and then so you have, in addition and like, to those... That is not a unique thing to like Test and Legacy, right? Waffles bailed out of PL for the or bailed out of Panfam for the most part. They like kind of come back, but they had booked it for a little yeah, while. Well, Waff yeah, Waffles is off doing its own thing right now. I kind of at when that happened, I stayed with Horde to, and joined Cap F because I personally this is the first bit really big war that's happened since I started playing. I want to see the whole thing, but. After it's over, I kind of want to go back to the medium stuff. What concerns and me... And a number of corporations yeah. have left Goon Swarm as well. Yeah. Paxton Federation, Dog right. Fort. One left NC Dob, but I think they were... Um, I don't think it was... Yeah, the, the corporation which left NC was... That's... Uh, was a small... There were, there are two corporations which have left NC since the war began. One would didn't really enjoy it as the war began and never really fully adjusted called no nothings and another which hops around alliances really often called uh remember the fallen yeah well here's here's a uh, i think an x factor that people don't consider and it's very much a meta play but you have good alternative games coming out at the same time that this war is really getting tough on imperium members right so i wonder how many people are going to just say, hey, you know what? It's no fun right now. Uh, there's not, you know, it's there's too much blue balls, not enough action, or we're just losing this. It's no fun to lose. I'm going to play this other game called Cyberpunk, for instance, or I'm going to play Watch Dogs uh, or some, something else that also uh, is kind of like EVE Online or, or fun, but not EVE Online. Yeah. Well, that's, always that's always the thing. Yeah. I don't know if that really... It, it affects both sides equally, right? So I don't think it's a big factor. So I, I think yeah, it, I, the question is really for goons is about 
not whether or not they rebound. It's it's whether you know how much buy and how how long it takes them. And yeah, that's definitely true. Wait, at least Randolph just told us that NC and PL stole the the Keepstar that Goonswarm had been on un- anchoring just now in KTAC six K one. Oh, there you go. <laughs> KTAC six. Uh, Let's check dude. that out. Didn't want it anyway. Thanks for watching the internal channel. Hashtag already replaced. Well, like I was saying before the stream, though, is I, I don't think that a lot, like, strategically wise, it looks bad for goons. But as far as content for the individual player of getting blue balled, I don't think I've had this much content, even when we were in Saranen, of if I want to go out on a fleet and PvP someone, it's on my doorstep. I literally can undock in a fleet and be fighting someone, or I can yeah. go to a like it's it's next door in T5Z. I go fight someone in, in T5Z. So you can yeah. get a revenue kill, one jump out of home. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. And and for the average live member, like man, there's revenants dying. Whether there's there's goons titans dying or uh, uh, passive titans dying, like there is content there for PvP if that's what you want. Like I don't think anyone's really getting super blue balled, no matter. What spin or what's oh you we we showed up uh well yeah you had twice your number so yeah we weren't gonna undock whether that's on either side whether Coon shows up with a two hundred man Serb fleet or like five, like three hundred corms yeah the, it makes sense that they're not gonna re undock the fifty jacked off fleet the test had but instead now they come with a five hundred man Munin fleet or whatever and then we go and hide in our corner and we go oh. Pfft. It's it's the same back and forth, but as far as the small gang to medium gang to even large gang stuff, I feel like there's plenty of fleets and plenty of content going on constantly. Right. So reiterating Keepstar in K Tax Six, that's Delve, that's NPC Delve. We're looking at the system here. I'll go ahead and put it on the map. I no, that's Sov Delve. Sorry, yeah, I, you're right. Sov Delve. It's one step out of uh uh NPC Delve. Keepstar stolen by PL and CPL took it from uh, unanchoring as it was unanchoring from Goon Swarm. That's a big, big <laughs> little robbery, I suppose. Honestly, I think that's bigger than if it was killed. Yeah, yeah, is, it is. Uh, is so, that dude just saying that in your chat, or is there some like no? Elise is of that? Elise is credible. He he never okay. He never tries to. Funny thing is, he said there was also a dread fight and Hippo Jacks. I think who's watching was one of the first guys in again. He was the first keep. He was the first Titan killed uh, in FWST. That big fight where the boson trap happened or didn't happen, actually. Yeah. So our friend Hippo Jax. Oh, and uh, one of Horde's FCs pinged out a, a screenshot of it being stolen just now. I was just curious. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but yeah, yeah, trolling yeah. does happen. I was just. I. Hey guys. We tra- oh. Hey Billy, oh. you want to give? Oh. You want to tell us the story? <laughs> Uh-oh. 48 keep stars on the wall. P- take one down, pass it around. 47 keep stars on the wall. All right. <laughs> Did it die in a uh, cargo hold? You guys actually get it out. I got it out, sounds like. Nice. Well, all right. <laughs> I, I can give a good old GG to you guys. Victory, I can yeah. appreciate good work. Well, I, I didn't do it. This is all NCPL. Like, yeah. uh, how did they. Uh, they they've been watching that thing for a while, yeah. like all of those the ones that they've unanchored. So one of the it's elements, a... sorry, I've had to unanchor a keep star before and sneak it out. Actually, with the help of Goon Swarm, thank you very much, uh, Asher. And it's a really good keep star, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's now the Tranquility Trade Tower. <laughs> but the uh, the idea between, behind a keep star unanchoring and why it's a little difficult is is you get to unanchor it. It takes a week to unanchor. I think it's a week. And nobody seven days, yeah. seven days. Nobody knows exactly when that minute is going to hit, except the owner of the Keepstar. And uh, so there is a surprise element there. So people kind of have to watch it all the time and be vigilant. Now, once you unanchor it, it will start to say unanchored, but you can re-unanchor it later to kind of throw off the count. So you, people don't really know when it's going to come out. But the problem is when you go to pick it up, sometimes it won't actually load into the freighter. And there's only one freighter that can carry a keep star. And that freighter is a Rhea, and it has to have uh, expanders on it in order to accommodate the scale of the keep star. So it's not that easy to do. So tell us what happened, uh, Vili, if you know, um, in this case. You know any details yet? Have they emerged? Uh, the details are, as far as I'm tracking, Peel, uh, there's a crew of guys that have been just 
like you you know doing doing the autism watch uh <laughs> where, where you know you just watch that keep star anytime a guy comes in he, he you just watch if the keep star does the cycle on the you know from unanchoring to not unanchoring to re-unanchoring again see if wow. you can get that timer um and or alternatively you drop one item into the keep star so whenever it goes unanchored you get a heads up message that you know this thing is now let's it's kind of like a notify right uh, I, I don't know the exact ways, but I know they were prepped for it, and wow. they got it. Looks like that's a that's a good steal. That's a that's another little uh, one for the history books. So did you cable did jealous, update? or did you how would that work? Did what? Sorry. Did you guys have the grid uh, that was that it was on, or in... goons, goons don't have a like large fleet formed up, and so so it was just. No one was hanging about. You guys just swooped in and grabbed it. My understanding is like a small like black ops group or something. They didn't have a fleet formed up for that. Well, the thing is, if you form a fleet, it kind of gives away the game, right? Yeah, it sums up. I, I'm I'm told like I'm just reading through the chat here. Apparently, Zungan dropped like two dreads to try and uh, you know kill the freighter or something. But uh... so, Billy, now that that's happening, you're talking about. Can I ask? Was the one DQ Sino Jammers a distraction? No, we oh. just go hit that thing to make goons form up uh, once or twice a day. Gets them. Uh, it's it's like you. Uh, what do you do? Tap the honey, the, the beehive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tap the beehive, make all the bu- the bees buzz, 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 and then you just you know let well, them go. Get them used to tapping the hive, right? Apparently, coincidentally, worked very well as a distraction. Well, I don't know what we really distracted them from, so. So uh, a little more information. I'm not sure this. I'm not sure about, but uh, quote here: Goon started unanchoring a few keeps, and I think they forgot. Uh, yeah. Big, it's- big build the boss. Apparently, big build the boss had something to do with it. We think. Yeah, this was the oh, first not one. Bill, dude. It might have been My a personal one. To... Oh no, Bill, dude. Big oof. If it was him, we don't know, but yeah. uh, it might have been a personal keep star. Do they have this? Yeah, this was the. I don't. This was the first that had been spotted on anchoring. So. This is actually the third that was spotted on anchoring. How much did he sell it to PO for? Oh, this would be an interesting. That would be interesting, right? You, you want to sell it, but you don't want to get blamed for selling it. So you do this. Uh, oh fake... no! I forgot about my Keepstar. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, there's a kill mail. He was in a phoenix when he died, so he was trying to kill the freighter, I suppose. Uh, I guess Hippo Jax might have been a part of that. Yeah, Hippo Jax is in there too. We'll, we'll take a look. If Hippo Jax is around, we'll throw him in here and see if he can tell us what happened. There's the kill mail for Hippo Jax. And, uh, wow, so, Billy, you'll get to talk probably to Big Bill the Boss on Trash Talk Tuesday tomorrow. You think this will come up? I might. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it might be, you know, mentioned in passing at least. <laughs> Take one down, pass them around. 47 keep stars left on the wall. On the wall. You know, one thing we didn't cover uh, that- Sunday because we ran out of time. We had Boat on, and Boat can be verbose, uh, but he's a lot of fun. And we didn't get to it uh, because we already had gone like two hours and a half. And that was the dismantling of Delve. Uh, so, uh, Vili, I wanted to talk to you about that because we were talking about the structures that are uh, going down and how a couple months ago they had like 220 structures. Is that 220 structures in Delve? Or... No, so they had 2,200 structures between Delve queries and period bases. Uh, they had closer to 3,000 if you include Fountain and Cloud Ring and all the rest, but those are all gone now. Like th- Those include initiative structures, I guess, but... My God, just think about that. 3,000 structures or 2,200 structures left in Quarius and Delve. Those are huge numbers. Yeah, what what happened to them saying that they'd make us bleed for every keep star? And well, you bled they a, didn't bleed you, for that one. You so. bled a Revenant. You bled a Leviathan. You've been, you've been bleeding. Uh, well, those aren't really what, bleeding so much as those are just like, people getting caught doing dumb stuff which yeah. is just par, par for the course and in terms of any real um 
conflict like this. And to be honest, we put ourselves close to them in 1DQ to, to amp up this opportunity for mistakes on, more on their side than ours, obviously. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that, you know, these kind of things aren't going to happen. So, so uh, Vili, you're in a good spot to answer this question that came up right before uh, you came on. Do you think that us being next door to each other, 1DQ and T5Z, is uh, generating a lot more content for the average line player and getting them more interested in the PvP experience of this war than it has before? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's hard not to when you can literally undock at any moment and jo join a gate camp that's, you know, sitting there and... Uh, you know, something will happen in pretty short order. You can walk through the gate and see the craziness uh, unfold on the other side if you really want to die. You know, for right. either side, usually. Right, and I, and I was saying that that goes for either side. Yep, but that's intentional, right? Like, we, we want to amp up the destruction. We want to amp up the SRP bills. We want to amp up the conflict. That makes it more interesting for our guys, and it makes it more costly for you guys, right? So that, that's kind of the, the way we want to play it. Right. All right, so let's talk about this mantling of Delve because it feels like that's what's happening, and I'm trying to be objective about it. But when you're going from 3,000 or so structures down to 2,200 and then down again to 1,800, like you are being taken apart. Uh, not well, only we're down bridges. to 1,600 now. 1,600. Oh. Don't you uh, mean 1,599, dude? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> But, well, I mean, the thing is, like, for the last two days, we've been killing an Athenor and Delve every 20 minutes. Yeah. A lot so, of them have been abandoned. So what happened is about a week and a half ago, uh, G-Soul guys came around and started uh, taking all the mods off of stripping every Athenor and Delve, basically, that uh, we can see. So they took all the mods off, they took all the fuel out, and they stripped the moon drill. So all of those uh, Athenors be started becoming abandoned, like, two or three days ago, and we've just been going around and killing them all. And I mean, to to me, it's one of the craziest things I've ever seen because for us, uh, you know, th those Athenors, like, yeah, yeah, they save like I don't know, 500 mil per Athenor by you know, reclaiming the fits and the fuel or whatever. But it means all of the members' stuff that was in those Athenors is now spawning into space every time we kill one, and it's turning into this massive fucking gold rush. Like everybody's out there trying to kill Athenors because they want to be the one that gets the next jackpot. We've already had like one or two of them. And, like, it, it's just crazy. Like, you know, just the average Athenor we kill seems to drop, you know, 5, 10, 15 ships. Like, it's, it's yeah. Bonzo's. Or yeah. Bonzo. So, Billy, if well, you don't mind sharing, not not in your home systems or whatever, but just in the Delve Queries, period basis, found area, all that, how many structures do you guys have up at this point? In Delve? You know? Yeah. I, well, I mean, Delve Queries, period basis, between all those, like... Uh... What, five keep stars, three Aquarius, two Delve, uh, maybe 25 forts, maybe, I don't know, 20 Athenors? <laughs> like, we, we haven't really moved in yet, so... Right, I'm just curious. Like, just... you know, one Sodio, one Star, like, you know, we're, we're not... Uh... And it's funny, because as we move in, we're going to be the first alliance in game to ever core, our, you know, core our structures as we go kind of thing, so... Uh, it's taken that little extra bit of. Uh, How much is time. a core for a keep star at this point? Thirty bill. Okay. What happened to the, what they were saying about how uh, they'd force everyone to just go through all those boring structure timers with now that they're letting their citadels go abandoned? Interesting point because now, like you're sitting there, you're not really getting too, much, you're not really fighting anybody over it, but you might get a big jackpot. Well, Sounds that's that's what's, been, that's what's been great about the Athenors, right? And, and yeah. as I say, like, you know, an Athenor every 20 minutes is quite the, you know, and for the most part we've been, you know, it's been a cu quiet couple of days and we've been pretty free to just let our guys go you know, nuts uh, killing Athenors all over the place. And it's important to remember, all those Athenors represent, like, a tactical advantage in every system they're in because they, they represent this free safe spot where people can safe up. The, you know, they're on gates or near gates. They're, like... There's just a ton of advantage to having these Athenors. So for us to be able to, you know, stop, take our time, kill 500 Athenors, like, because that seems to be somewhere in the range of what it's going to be, uh, like, this is a great opportunity for us. And as I say, it's, you know, all the guys all go to kill mouse, they all get loot. Um, you know, the, the T5 market is filling up with fucking Mackinaws and skiffs that are popping into Athenors. <laughs> like, so we'll have lots of mining ships when the time comes. You know, it's a... Uh, 
it's uh it's going good i don't want to say and as far as like you know they were going to make us bleed for every structure like narratively everyone knows that's not true that's never how like it's never been that way in the history of the game has any war happened where somebody has has, had to grind through every single structure what happens is the two sides sit next to each other uh, like a deciding point happens and one side breaks that's what's happened in every single war from the start of Eve to now, I am not familiar with a single war in which an enemy fought and died for every single structure to the last man kind of thing. It's not feasible for most of the structures. Usually it's not feasible is a good way to put it, yeah. So, um, you know, we're driving forward. We're continuing to kind of surround 1DQ and set up for, you know, the siege. Uh, we're setting up our strangle and we're just, you know, taking our time and enjoying the peace and quiet as we approach i guess you could say so i mean in, in all in all honesty like the the what taking over 1dq by christmas not really that feasible what we do you were think never gonna time- take one no no but that's what everyone thinks right what do you think is a feasible timeline to where goons are going to be if not in 1dq like push back to low sec what do you think the timeline of this war looks like going forward i don't try to make timelines timelines are a trap I just say it's going to take as long as it's going to take, you know. Right. I, I remember talk saying this exact same thing on uh, TIS, I think, three, four months ago, where people were like, one to Q by Christmas. And I was like, no, nah, it could be January, it could be February. And then they're like, they made a Reddit post, it's like, Valentine's Day war. And I'm like, no, it could be longer. You know, it, it's, this is, uh, this is not going to be a short war. Goons aren't giving up. They're fighting hard. Uh, and, you know, they're determined to try and break us uh, apart rather than break us. Uh, on the field right and they're gonna they they know that their best chance of doing that is just to try and hold on as long as they can the problem of course being that the longer you sit here under this kind of siege the more pressure it is on your member base right now do you think that of the last war it's going to be like a fall back to a low sec again or do you think you have a good chance of pushing us and goons at breaking apart the alliance all the way out of the game which one do you think is probably more realistic i guess that is a snoo snoo for those who are curious he's from the imperium asking questions well i've been pretty consistent i think at this point i don't think there's any realistic way to break an alliance out of game but you can hurt them and you can diminish them and you can kick them into low sec and make them an unappealing choice for new recruits and there's there's a ton of ways to destroy alliances but like saying that you're going to make them quit i don't even want them to quit what i would like to have them do is just become a much more manageable group where the galaxy is able to have them in it and be a player, but not be the only player at that level where it doesn't take the entire galaxy teaming up to do something against them. Right. And that kind of falls in line with the argument I made earlier. Oh, hey, this is Timerian. Yes. So, uh, uh, Legacy Radio guys. Timerian is the guy that I was mentioning earlier who is from Imperium. He's going by a different name. You might have just That'd probably him. be more than willing to. You, oh, you that's it, dude. House you might have just outed him. He was going by a different name. Throwing COVID on him, dude. You're going to get him kicked. <laughs> clip it, boys. Clip it. I just get. So, Ty, uh, did you do? You, what do you do? You have any uh, comments on this uh, stolen keep star? I didn't know anything about it until someone mentioned it in chat, and then Billy came in here. I was t- doing talking in stations this whole time. <laughs> With a carrier in front of my screen. Yeah, we were just about to wrap up, and then this came down. Uh, uh, the pike uh, was announced just as we were about to stop. We were on the last question. But now it was worth staying on and covering this, but a stolen keep star is a, quite a big deal. NCPL taking it from Imperium. It looks like it might have been a personal keep star of Big Bill the Boss. And Man. Uh, that's, Poor Bill, dude. That's the I'm working... pretty sure that's just a troll where he's trying to oh, get okay. attention. Okay. Yeah, he, he's a uh, he's a ma- he likes trolling people. That Bill is notorious for that. Um. Yeah. Okay. So we don't know what the situation is. We just know Keepstar was taken, and uh, that's got to hurt. How many Keepstars are in Delve? One less than yesterday. Yeah. There okay. is forty Keepstars left in Delve now. Wait, uh, okay, so there's still... Six left in Aquarius and one in period basis, I believe. So 47 total. Were we over 60 at one point? I feel like we were. At one point, you were at exactly 60. But you lost one in 
tribute. You unanchored the four in Cloud Ring. You unanchored the one in Northern Northeastern Aquarius. You lost the six in Fountain. And now we're at 47. Oh, Billy, as long as we have you here, something came up. Uh, War Bonds uh, were on the Fireside chat. What is your characterization of what's going on there? I know this is giving you an unfair <laughs> platform to talk, but I really do like your insight, and I think it's valuable. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, I, I've said from the beginning that goons are not as organizationally wealthy as they have claimed to be. Many people have watched the Goon MER over the years and said, oh my God, they're making so much money. And I've always kind of held the opinion that, yeah, their members are getting rich. But uh, it, it was very obvious to me at certain times when working with the Imperium at other points that they weren't building industrial wealth in the way that a normal alliance at, at their scale should. Um, you know, for, for me, one of those moments was, I think, during, you know, the x47 battles when i was asking them about their fax cash and they had basically nothing and at this point you know test had like 700 or 800 or a thousand capitals in our caches and you know goons had like next to nothing and i was like holy shit right because they, they've always built their system on a, on a different style where they rely on their industrialists to um kind of support them and and they're much more about the churn and the revenue and the inputs minus the outputs yeah it's uh and, top-down versus bottom-up economy where instead of uh, giving money to the state and the state supplying everybody, you had uh, everybody uh, gets an opportunity to make money and then you tax the masses. And that's how Goon Swarm was making money. Yeah. But the problem with that system is so much of the wealth just leaves the game from quitting. So much of the game just leaves the... So much of the wealth leaves the alliance from people moving on to different places, to selling their money for plex to selling their money yeah. for skins like th th there is a thousand different outputs of the money that they're making and especially when people feel they're rich people spend like they're rich and or changing right. sides too that that's a, right it doesn't breed loyalty so so people are you know for years being part of the you just go to the imperium in order to make money but yeah. those people aren't aren't looking to make the imperium strong they're looking to ro move to rome to seek their fortune you know so um you know, the Imperium have always tried to, or at least uh, the last few years, has been trying to really present themselves as being the best place for people to just go to make money. But that doesn't foster long-term loyalty. So as soon as the going gets rough and the money dries out, they're going to go look for somewhere else for money. So the thing is, they've now implemented, obviously, or they, they've started prepping their members for the reality of war bonds, which is to say to their membership, you know, we need you guys to give us some money and we'll, we promise to pay it back later. Um, obviously nobody is ever going to announce this if they aren't actually about to do it. Um, nobody thinks to themselves, I better tell my alliance that we might need to do war bonds soon if they're not already in a financial crunch. N nobody, the narrative hit on this, and I'm sure they're well aware of it because they were trying to get ahead of it with this fireside, is so massive that there's no way the goon... Uh, leadership could ever have missed it, right? Yeah, there's... so it, it speaks to the level of um, concern that they may have in terms of what this is going to mean. And obviously, to us, it says, "Hey, our strategy is working. They're bleeding money. They threw away seven trillion isk in those fights over NPC Delve, and now they're struggling to uh, keep keep going at the level they have been. And obviously." You know, the fact they announced at the fireside, they just finished the YZ9 Super Cap Rune Plate SRP, which six weeks later is is pretty embarrassing to me. Uh, like, I, I would have had that done in the next day. Like, it, it's just kind of mind-blowing uh, and signals a lot of weakness that uh, just works in, in Pappy side's favor, obviously. Yeah. I thought this thing about SRP that got mentioned in the fireside was a bigger deal than the War Bonds. Well, it, it is and it isn't, right? So goons don't, S, like, I'll be blunt, goon subcap SRP, I, I mean, it's the same as test. Like, everybody gets 100%. You know, goons used to get above 100%, but they don't anymore. Um, but the goon SRP team, like, for subcaps is way better than the test SRP. They just, like, boom, they pay that shit. It's so quick, it's crazy. But at the capital and at super cap level, when they're trying to get holes, because they don't have that in organizational... Um, 
that organizational structure where they have paid out uh, where they have the holes to just give the guy. Like, I know a test, I, you know, we lose 20 Titans, here's 20 Titans, brand new to the pilot an hour later, right? No issue. Um, but I know goons don't have the holes. They don't have the holes sitting there. So they've just got, you know, either piles of money or piles of moon goo that they have to then sell in the market to get money to buy Titan holes from people who are either quitting or whatever, right? Because most of the, the factories in Delve are now shutting down. So there's no more super caps being built. Isn't uh, there a side from Sorry, isn't there a problem with um, your guys or Pappy guys buying, I don't know, dreadnoughts or capitals or even supers from out from under them? Like, is that a is that a thing? Oh yeah, I've got like forty carriers and a couple of hells sitting in Ermal and Asset Safety myself. What, what right. is that? Like, I mean, is that a product Goon? of an open market or what's the problem? How, how is that possible? Market so you just get a spy good. to. Uh, you know, buy the capitals off their market, right? Because they had underpriced them to be, you know, goon mineral cost. Uh, it meant that, you know, anybody in EVE could literally just buy them off their market, pay the 15% asset safety surcharge, and it was still a deal, right? So, you know, months before, well, I don't know if months, but at least two months before the war, I know we emptied like 500 dreads off their market. Uh, Jeez, like, like, you know, and, and we've just been cycling through it over the course of the last four or five months. Any time a reasonable amount of caps is put up on the like open market, uh, not through the, the like their forum sellers, you, you just go to town and buy what you can with a spy. Uh, and and that of course doesn't even touch on what's just put up on public, which is a non-zero amount too at times. That, that burns right. really crack down on that lately. That burns. That will also right include out, not right? just. Sorry. Well, it's all right. Oh, it burns a spy right out, right? Because you just buy, 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 buy until they kick you or something, or. Yeah, yeah, but like or spies weren't hard speed. to get in goons with Karma Fleet like up until a few months ago, right? So, okay. right. Go ahead, it's new. And I, I would say even a bigger issue than all the caps is it, they're doing the exact same thing with the subcaps and the doctrine ships. Let's be honest. And there is market warfare on both sides, but it's definitely way more detrimental to the goons right now to have these subcap doctrine fits and these uh, capitals bought out from under them. Um, yes, would, well, yeah, especially especially since it's war of attrition, right? So the the guests obviously have to ha haul their equipment in, whereas the home field advantage is that you have your equipment. So the more stuff that the invaders can buy off of the home home advantage, not only does the home no longer have those equi that equipment, but now the invaders do. One of the so, biggest mistakes, like, and I think when people look back at this war in six or eight months or a year or whatever, they will look at the the Delve NPC Keepstar situation when they suicided literally, you know, 4,000 battleships um, as one of the greatest, like, strategic blunders or fearic victories or whatever you want to call it in, like, the history of EVE, right? Like, at a time when mineral scarcity is at its peak, you're throwing away literally 4,000 battleships worth of minerals just pumping into ravens that, to, to be shredded by long-range dreadnoughts and supers and carriers. Uh, you know, to the tune of a thousand plus per per fight, right? Like, th there, there's no way to me that that people don't look back and say that was one of the biggest mistakes of this war. Especially when you consider what you could do with seven trillion in money when it comes to like even just like hiring mercenaries. Seven trillion this could buy you a lot of friends. It will. And the word on the street that I've seen, at least, is they've been quite stingy in that regard. Stingy in spending isk or stingy in hiring allies? Stingy in what they were willing hiring to allies. pay for mercenaries gotcha. to come work for them. Um, are you talking I about Vika or groups. like who are you talking about? I know a number of groups who they approached asking them to either come fight or do stuff for them. And... They either didn't offer anything, or, or they offered so little that they told them to fuck off. Are oh, you talking about mercenaries being hired by the Imperium? Mm -hmm. You want to? Well, put I, any, any names on that, or I, 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 no. I can. I don't think he'd be willing to say it, but I can tell you. I know me and Murray have, probably have some of the same friends, and and I've heard very very similar stories from from certain groups you want to put any names yeah, it's not it's just DTM thing like i've yeah, talked to not my place people. man 
who independently were I mean, like, look at the map. Assholes? And we were like, how much? And they either said, didn't have a dollar amount or like it was so little that nobody cared. Well, I mean, you can look at the map and you can guess, right? So it's like Volta literally triggered freight train diplomacy. Um, L trigger. And fam, so that'd be uh, a dark side probably. Um, Let's go put on the crab suit. Don't you know well, dark me? side's been doing some damage to Horde, so maybe they actually were hired uh, or not. I don't well, know. Dark side, no, dark side don't don't accept a mat. Like, dark, like okay. props to dark side. They're not interested in masters. They they're like they are their own kind of dragon, and you know they're annoying to me as much as they're annoying to anybody else. But like, give give props where they're due, right? They're the kind of guys that are willing to go throw down, and they don't want any blues or bosses. Okay, thanks for that. Strata, have you been... What's your group called again? Uh, I'm with Dock Workers. I've, I've recently joined, joined oh, them in the last month. Do you know month. if There's you guys have been... Group. Have you been approached to enter the war? You know what? I, I, I wouldn't be able to, to say. I'm, I'm not at high up in, in this organization. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Not at all. Nobody would tell you. I know. <laughs> no, no. I, I, w- I mean, again, I'm not. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make sure that we don't just talk about hearsay and that sort of stuff. The one thing I like about Vili is he's a prime source, right? He's in charge of the data. He's in charge of the information. And that's valuable. But to hear people say, I heard this, I heard that, we really have to take that with a grain of salt. Yes. It don't listen true, to anything but... me or Murray say. Everything we say is hearsay. Listen, chat. So, so the, Billy, I, mean, I got a question for you. If you if you want to be the master of data and put the final kibosh on something I've been wondering about personally, how much does the average line member pay for a Cormorant uh, doctrine fit in T five Z right now? Because I've heard everything from ten million to fifty million. Well, I don't have a horror character, so I can't uh, open up the contracts right now. So, but I, I guess I can look a horror you, character. I, I've got I, I've got enough to do on my own characters. He's got, uh, he's got salvaging to do. <laughs> Gregorian, you're in Horde, aren't you? Like what? Or maybe you're not. But do you know? I'd have to log in. Uh, We're hearing. 25, I don't know right? off the top of my head, but yeah, twenty five <laughs> sounds like it. There's it one on contracts on accurate. public for twenty. So, and, yeah. nobody uses public. So. Every time I hear it, it just goes keeps going up and up to ridiculous numbers. I'm like, there's no way they're paying that much. Probably like forty mil, honestly. I don't know. If I mean, he said, to... I... "Yeah." Check right now. What's the significance of that question? Couple that, minutes. that sounded like a point, like a you were well, looking for. Well, so there's been a lot of instances in fighting in T5Z where we'll be out in our corn fleets or whatever fleets, right, and we'll kill one of their corn fleets or something will happen or our corn fleet will all die. And then it, uh, and then a bunch of horde and test guys will come loot like in mass, a lot of these cormorant wrecks. And then someone keeps jokingly says, Oh yeah, it's cause they pay so much for cormorants. They're having trouble shipping them in and moving them. And then they're like, Oh yeah. Cause they pay this much for cormorant. So it's worth it. And the value keeps going up and up. And the latest one I heard was like 50 mil for a cormorant. Yeah. Well, so, here, no, that- here's your answer. Let me just put this on the record here from Imposeto. Uh, I can answer that. A T2 com in Horde is 25 million given by an FC and 27 million on contracts. That sounds very specific. Yeah, there's I, one one Horde FC, Mist Amatin, who also runs the Russian part of Horde. He he really likes leading Cormorant roams when he's not doing strat ops. That's most of what he does. Isn't Mist French, I, not Russian? I know that towards the beginning of the war, that was a big thing. Was that they were selling? That was one of the like the memes that they're selling corms for really expensive. I remember even CSV Convict made a joke about it on a stream once. Uh, Brisk Rubal says they are thirty-two million right now. Uh, so Brisk is not in Horde. He might have a spy. I don't know. <laughs> but Brisk anyway, would probably never. does because everyone has a spy. Standing CSM member. Why would he have a spy? Because yeah, he's so an upstanding the, the, CSM member. <laughs> because it's easy enough to get a horde spy that I just assume everyone does. All right. Well, give me a second. I'll find it. <laughs> Settle it. Now. Listen, I mean, we well, put, the opportunity to prove brisk a liar is always a, <laughs> a good opportunity. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, like, you're, uh, if you're going to say something, we'll we'll put that to your name, whether you're brisk or anybody else, and then you got to like stand for it and stuff, but. Don't come on and say you were joking. Like, we're not going to allow that. Yeah. I mean, if, 
So, if you're talking about giving so the, the opportunity to call Brisk a liar, I gotta say his last show on things uh, I believe it was his last show, I'm not sure, the Theta Thursday talk on Thanksgiving, he brought us some really interesting points that you guys should go watch it. Uh, okay, I'll I'll check it out. Here is a supplied by Brisk Rubal, uh T five Z Delve thirty two. I can't see what it is. Oh, it's yeah. Comrat over here, Defender Comrat T two. So there's his evidence, and that looks convincing. I don't know. I don't know what this is about. Like I, this is the first time I've heard about Comrades being a thing. It should be easy to ship in there. Just yeah, the it's, right? it started when at the beginning of the war, back when we were staging out of Hafib, uh, uh, before local industry set up, when T T one hulls like Comrades were disproportionately more expensive because they're uh, lower value per cubic meter, so they take up more jump freighter space than T2, than a similar value of T2 hulls. Wow. So, so Brisk isn't just a liar. He's one of those guys who actually fakes the data to uh, make it so. Is this fake? Am I showing fake data? Brisk. Well, he, he, he's, he's uh, shown you the high end of the price range, not the bottom end. Oh, still deceptive so not, practices. Mis not, misleading. Not good. That's misleading. Not good. Well, oh, no, so, guys. Well, let's, so, let's take a look at the picture I put in TIS chat. What does that look like to you? Where'd you put it? Uh, it Twitch chat, sorry. Oh, okay. Quick, to check to make yeah. sure that Villa didn't just put up all the contracts. Yeah, he right just relisted a bunch of corpses. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Greater than so, yeah, at the when, yesterday. So back when we were staging out of Hafib, a lot of people shipped oh, in their seven. own stuff to sell before local, before we could get industry set up locally and sold for the cost of shipping it in. So then the Imperium noticed and tried to use that to accuse uh, FCs like Mist of ripping off line members. And that was back what before mineral prices were lower, so you, n you could normally get them for ten to fifteen. So some people listed them at thirty-five. So I have to play the brisk devil's advocate here. Um, he's saying he's looking at it right now, and I do notice a lot of those are like T ones or no defenders. Right. Um, That's why I started from the T one and went down to the T two defender. Down, down here at the bottom. I don't, can you see that? That's how you normally search price lowest first, right? Look at the bottom right. here is what, what I'm looking at. <laughs> I mean, he just said he's looking at it right now and that that's accurate. Yeah, so I'm sure he can look at it. And if you scroll down, you can see the most expensive cormorants. But I'm showing you the cheapest oh, yeah. one, which is what normal people look at, not the most expensive ones. <laughs> Brisk is correct. There are cormorants for sale for that price. Uh, yeah, Billy is also fun. correct. There are cheaper ones as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Okay. Cormit, yeah, eighteen million from sell orders from Jita right now. All right. Well, that's okay. Meme, meme settled. Uh, thank you, Brisk. Thank you, Billy. Thank you. Oh, who was the first guy uh, who was accurate? Unholy. Yeah, yeah. This is settled. All right. No. Yeah. Unholy well, asked. Not... Unholy asked a question, but it was it, it was another guy, and I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, who said 20, 25 million from the FC, twenty seven million on contracts, and yeah, Impos Imposito. That's it. Yeah, so thank you guys. Yeah, so it looks like the cheapest Defender Corms are 26.75, and then t without Defender, T1 and T2 guns are available for cheaper. Well, there's T2 Longbow Corm, which I assume is the same thing uh, for 23 there. I don't know the fit, um, but... Yeah, Longbow is without a Defender. Cool. All right, but so, like I said, yeah. from my understanding, this meme came from the early days of the war. Um, that's when I remember it being talked about most. And I'd be surprised if that was still true. Okay, let's wrap up. Because uh, ah. I've been sitting in this chair for two hours after yesterday, two and a half hours, and that hurts. Um, but I do want to say that something big happened about an hour ago. That's why we stayed on an extended hour. That was a Keepstar was stolen by NCPL. It was stolen from the Imperium. We don't know uh, exactly from who in the Imperium, but no form, no fleet was formed to defend it. So it was a kind of like a sneak unanchoring that went wrong. And we can't confirm or deny whether or not it was sold. And we can't. Yes, you're right. Next, have we have we discussed the mechanics thing. of unanchoring? Yeah. And why this would happen? I did. Yeah, we did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Good. Cool. Uh, and we can do it another time. Um, 
is there anything else that you guys uh, want to bring up before we take off? Next time that we have two people both saying different things about the same subject, like Brisk and Billy, you should just put them on the show and give them each a rookie uh, ship and have them duke it out. Whoever wins is that's the truth, right? That's how reporting works. Or yeah, how about, be one at Thera. That's a, that's or a, how about we settle it with a rap battle referee oh, by yeah. Rich Richmond? No, I'll referee it, dude. I'll referee I'm, the rap battle. All right. I support this product in our service. The only thing I would say, um, just since I have the op- since it's about to come up, we're entering into December. Yep. Uh, December is going to be the Yule Festival and the Japanese localization. So you have the new uh, the new skins that are on the premium market that will be probably released as part of that, and we have a lot of probably several new activities and and content for us to engage with once Yule gets started. So keep an eye out on the news. All right. Sounds good. Uh, just a couple more minutes. Thanks for those last minute announcements. I do want to recap one more thing uh, and I'll probably throw it to Billy again because I, I want to I emphasize I think it's an important thing and he does too. Uh, Imperium issuing war bonds in case they need, I think, is it in case they need to core their structures? And it doesn't appear that they're even fueling some of their structures. So why would they worry about having a fund to core their structures? Like they're look, I, I believe I, I can't remember what it said there. I, I honestly have only just read the cliff notes repeatedly given to me by people who actually did listen to fireside. Um, but basically they're looking for 1.5 trillion or something like that to supplement their funds so that they can purchase cores, which means that they don't have 1.5 trillion to buy cores. Or they don't want to take it out of their military fund, for instance. Or Well, they or, don't have the liquidity to buy them. Re- regardless of how you want to phrase it, they need $1.5 trillion-esque. It's what they're, they're saying, whether they want to say, admit they're buying you know, ships with it or cores with it or whatever. Uh, we need some money is what they're saying. Um, or, or we, would, we or, will soon need the money because they haven't like officially have. issued them yet. Yeah. What's yeah. the repayment rate? Do we know? No, they, so they haven't f- <laughs> officially uh, put them out yet. So there was a meme thread on Reddit where it's like, you just don't get any money. But obviously, they'll be, uh, I assume they'll have like a 5 or 10% interest rate or something and be paid back over a couple of years. But there is an interesting we, uh, contradiction here, isn't there? That um, you're, you're abandoning structures, allowing them to, you're allowing yourself to save some money by taking the fuel out and taking the fittings out. Sure, you save some money, but when those things blow up, uh, it loot drops, giving these invaders more incentive to do that sort of thing, destroy those things. And you're kind of screwing your comrades, I imagine, which is not something that goons are known to do. They don't, they don't do that. Um, well, but, sure. no, a couple things with that. A couple things with that. Yeah. First of all, just because they're buying a core doesn't mean they're buying a core for their currently anchored structures. Uh, you need cores to anchor new structures. So if they're planning on moving, they would need more cores in order to anchor new structures. Um, and secondarily, oh, that's, okay. if you're letting a structure go abandoned, you could theoretically lock everybody out and force everything into asset safety prior to it even happening. So you can actually save everybody's stuff, I'm pretty sure, um, with a, and avoid it like being part of the abandonment process. Oh, hey, Matt, can I say something real yeah, quick? Yeah, of course, yeah. Not related to this topic, the last one, like, guys... Like me and Billy are on opposite sides, but I haven't done personal attacks with them. There's no reason to do personal attacks against Brisk and however you feel about it. It's a video game, guys. Take the personal attacks yeah. out of it. Yeah, yeah I'm like personally Brisk. attacking them. They're just, they're no. just, you know, calling him out for lying, right? There's no need for that. Well, he he wasn't lying. He was accurate. He was, and he might have accidentally. <laughs> he was manipulating the truth. My he, bad. He might he might have been. We maybe he made an accident there. I he actually don't. That one yeah. time at Bang Camp. Okay, so yeah, last I li- go ahead. I like Brisk as a person, but no, he was no, no, we're not going to manipulate it. We're not going to no, 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 we're not going to do that at all. Uh, Save this for Tuesday, yeah, guys, guys, dude. Take Tuesday, that, take that to a different channel. Um, I, again, I I just want to look at it strategically because it feels like what's happening on the grassroots level is not in coordination with what's happening on the state level inside the Imperium. So Imperium's getting ready to make you fight, Billy, I'm talking to you, over structures. But the but the but the population is kinda feels like they're running for their lives if they're stripping these things down and leaving them abandoned. You know what I mean? 
Well, so this is the thing that gets me. Like, you wouldn't need to core all your structures, even if you were going to keep them, because so a structure that is not cored loses tethering, uh, fitting, and, fitting repair. and repair. So in theory, certain structures could just go without a core and be perfectly fine. But if you're trying to anchor new structures, you will absolutely need a core. I, I know right. you're. I know you're pushing that, but you, you're kind of insinuating that they're they're planning for the future. Well, they are to a degree, right? Like, but it's also a convenient reason to say you need money. Is like, well, we need cores for all these keep stars we have, you know. Instead of just saying, hey, we need money to pay for our SRP to keep the war going, right? Yeah, you wouldn't ever admit that publicly if that was the truth, right? Exactly, because as soon as the SRP dries up or goons are in a situation where they're having to say, uh, we don't have any more money, everybody knows that the the pyramid scheme is over, right? And at that point, the, uh, the everything falls apart in very short order. Yeah, I have a crazy idea. So right. they know that they have all of the, all these people have all this stuff in their keep stars, right? They know that they've had people that are not loyal to the Imperium, but in the Imperium, making money and doing stuff for all this time. So what if they pull the fuel and bash their own abandoned structure to get everybody else's stuff? Uh, the problem is that would spit out their own stuff, right? Like, well, for, for, well, they for, can for, move for their own stuff first. Well, you can and you can't, right? Unfortunately, with a Keepstar like 1DQ or any of these big Keepstars where people would have the assets, uh, the vast majority of people, like, for every one person that's playing the game, there's probably two or three that aren't at this point, right? And those right. might have been your friends or your loyal boys or whatever, right? So you don't want to screw them over just to get back at some people that, you know, used and abused you kind of thing. I don't know. I, I could definitely see an image where the people that are there feel that they deserve the stuff and the people that aren't there didn't help. So don't that, you know, the repurposing their stuff and, uh, you know, gaining I, I mean, I mean the you're not wrong to the collective. You're not wrong. But at this point, we would be the ones getting their stuff, not. Doing yeah, that's stuff. true. Yeah, you have to hold the grid enough to loot it. But it's just it'd be a crazy idea, wouldn't it? So, Billy, sure. I got a, I got a question for you. Um, you're basing. Goons being broke off this war bonds for the most part, it seems like, correct? Or do you have other empirical data? Because I, I'd point out that I there, had, there was a lot of stored income. Because you're talking, I, I'm assuming you're talking more on an alliance level, whereas, like, I have a, I have a lot of ISK. I have supers my own. They don't belong to the alliance or the court necessarily. I can give them to them if I want to. I'm not forced there's, to. There's a difference between personal wealth and organizational wealth. And right. I, 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 I probably fundamentally know more about it than arguably maybe anyone in the game just because of the amount I've had to deal with it through the TTT in terms of how that has kind of worked. Right, um, and I'm not goons denying have that. Goons have never been an alliance that was incredibly organizationally wealthy. When they were making the biggest box in Delve, when they were pulling in the 17 trail MERs, whatever, I, I, I talked to people and they gave me an idea of what they were making per month. And the crazy thing is they were making a lot of money, like a lot, a lot of money, but they were, their, their expenses were also through the roof. They were saving none of it. And the, and the money that they were, uh, their profit, I guess you could say, was going into the weirdest things. And to, to me, it, it was just a, kind of a symptom of the failure to kind of long-term strategic plan. And I, I've seen it over and over again, and there's a number of different pieces of both evidence and intelligence that i have about you know the goon finances that obviously i either can't say here and i, and I know you can say I, I don't know what i'm talking about many people have said that before uh but you know in, in the end um the, the the reality come you know you can only hide the truth for so long and to me the war bonds is just one more time i am proven correct that perhaps there is something financially wrong in goon's work what what do you think they were spending their money on if they weren't spending it on sensible things? What, examples of what would you would you say? So goons ran something called a shit stack or something like that SRP, where they would literally SRP anyone who wanted to do anything in the game. Basically, uh, it, it, it's I don't know all the nuances of it. You could you could bring Atrium or somebody else up here to talk about it, but they would spend literally hundreds of billions of ISK in just giving finding ways to reimburse people doing whatever they wanted basically and they would uh, at the same time do 200 percent srp for anybody in gunwaf corp not a, not any of the other corps mind you but like you know it was, i think it was 125 percent for 
goon fleet or goon swarm members and then if you're a goon waff member you got another 75 percent i have somebody in chat can correct me i'm but those things all brisk, they're doing is, is they're correct. <laughs> but what those things are doing is they're taking organizational wealth the tax that the alliance and coalition are generating and they're pushing it back to the member base right a and the member base is already insanely rich right like this member base was making more money than any group in the game. And they were then pushing all of that organization wealth back to them. And the, uh, as much as I can respect that, and we try to push as much member wealth back to our guys as we can, you have to understand that organizational wealth is what wins you wars like we're having right now. It is the thing that allows you to do the things you can't do otherwise. And while goons built some organizational wealth, I'm pretty sure they burned through at least a good quarter to half of it in the, delve npc stuff and i i just think they they they've squandered uh, a, a lot of it to be honest i mean do you think that even with that money even with not having squandered it this it would improve their chances here i mean they were clearly outnumbered 100 percent, yeah so like let me give you an easy example during the the delve npc battles they burned through a good a very large portion of their dread caches um their dread caches should have been three, four, or five times the size of that. So that they could literally, every time we did anything with a Titan, they could dump 250 dreads on it. And you could take those losing battles and you could just dread bomb, dread bomb, dread bomb, dread bomb, dread bomb. Like to, to the tune of like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 dread losses. Especially when they had the ability to build these dreads at the cost of effectively 1 billion isk nowadays. Right? Like uh, the, the level of just poor, like, like, these caches so, are nowhere near what they should have been. So what's the game plan then? Like, like when they well nine uh, seven seven trillion isk worth of isk or however much it was in in those defenses, like the attitude was, well, this this is only happening because it's a drop in the bucket to us. But it, it, what you're proposing is that if this is like literally like the last of their war chest, effectively, like, does that really make sense? Do you really think that they would like try to bluff with the last of their money in yes. a defense to kill a keep star? 100 percent so okay. what, what, what happened on the first keep star battle is they saw the keep star they made the play they got pot committed to that fight to the tune of like two three hundred bill and then eventually they killed the keep star right and at the cost of like 700 bill and they declared that a massive victory massive victory the killing that first keep star in a piece of then the next one was dropped almost instantaneously right and then they're like because we were yanking that victory back out of them and now they're pot committed to that fight the next fight because they got to be like we've got to kill this keep star because if we don't kill this keep star we just threw away all that isk we wasted on the first one right and now you're pocket committed to the second keep star and they kill it but this time they lose a trillion isk but they're holding us off they're breaking us you know the the narrative there it, it, it just it gets you so committed into your own mind that now you, you can't let us get a keep star you have to suicide you have to suicide you have to stop it and uh, in my opinion, they just they played into their own head. Uh, like, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I, I don't think so. From the perspective of the invaders, uh, Pappy, that is Vili, uh, leader of Test. Not necessarily the leader of Test. I'm a right. leader All in right. Test. A leader I in Test. Yeah, correct. Um, let's wrap up because uh, we're going to shoot it over to uh, Baleful Dysmonia. Dysnomia. Oh. One more thing. Yeah. You know which NC member picked up the Keepstar? Who? <laughs> Heard it was Pro God, right? Pittsburgh. No. Oh. <laughs> uh, <That's> it, <laughs> just funny. All right. The uh, irony continues. Okay, everybody. Thanks for watching this marathon daily show. We usually don't have more than 30, 40 minutes. We went two hours today because of late breaking news and great guests and great conversation. The first half was about. Uh, small gang stuff and some of their issues, which was really cool. That was the first hour. The second hour, back to Nilsec and talking about uh, this uh, keep star that was absconded with. Uh, thank you, Billy, for coming by and uh, lighting up the show. Thank you, guys. Uh, everybody in the audience, Brisk, thanks for coming. And everybody else out there, really appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and raid uh, Baleful, and we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow on Talking in Stations.